there's a reason they have that many users. I hope it's not because we're stupid. I'm going to go with the other because I'm a user. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of like in the old days before Postman, you, you were sending these packets of data, but it was really hard to do anything. Now you've got... Welcome back to the show. Today, we're looking at Agile Cold Fusion API development using the amazing Postman and some uh, behavioral driven development secrets and cold box with John Farr. And he's going to be talking on this at Into the Box in a few weeks time. And we'll look at why you should be use, building APIs in Cold Fusion and why in particular you should be using the Postman and cold box for doing that. And we'll look in detail at what cool things you can get with Postman, either in the free version or the paid version. So actually, you can get a long way with the uh, paid, the free version. <laughs> and we'll also look at agile development and why you should be doing that. So welcome, John. Thank you. Good to be here. And in case you don't know, John has been in the Cold Fusion community for millennia, I think, or possibly 20 years, one or the other. Two centuries at least. To, <laughs> you cross the, the other century and he's he's been involved with uh, jQuery and Knockout and Vue libraries and he wrote a Cold Fusion framework which we'll talk about a little bit later so first of all what, let's talk about APIs why should people listening be building their APIs using Cold Fusion well one of the reasons is it works it's a lot of things we do, we jump in, we don't even know if it's going to work, and we find out there, there's all these, ah, I wish I would have known. But in particularly when using Cold Fusion and Cold Box, that technology is there. Cold Fusion, in fact, has some API stuff in it, or Lucy, that's both variations. But Cold Box adds a real mature system in. And when I talk about that in particular, wait till you guys see if you haven't started messing with it. Cold Box 5 should be out for the show. And it has some nice enhancements along the API line. Yeah, I hope that's going to be announced and uh, before the Into the Box show. A um, lot of cool things in there. So you decided you're going to build an API. Wait, let's back up a minute. Why, why do you want to have an API in your application to start with? Wait, what's the reason for doing this? Well, historically, when we started building apps, the, what we did when we wrote applications is you packaged everything into one box. And over time, you know, things, they say the only constant has changed, so it may go back to that. It's not what we are right now. But what we tend to do is your data connector is your API it's where, and your business logic is validated on the API. But your actual application in most web applications is actually pulled right out and all the stuff you look at, all the validation that happens immediately in the browser, that's a separate application. And that's why we've started migrating from where I used to use a lot of jQuery to where we're using stuff like Vue or uh, you're using Angular or you're using React, they should stay around in spite of their uh, privacy issues, but we'll see. <laughs> For those of you who have missed all the Facebook fame, that's where React comes from. But they're all great frameworks. And, but I, jQuery was mainly, it made your DOM and all the stuff you sent to the browser, jQuery manipulated that and made it work. When you pull that out as a completely separate piece, jQuery isn't written to do that. When they're together, jQuery is still extremely viable. You still have the option of using Vue or Angular, but it's still viable. But when you separate them out, you really want to go to one of the modern frameworks. Your API is that back end that's communicating with it. And an API, when you're building it, you're either doing that for part of your app or for the whole app because you've completely separated the two. And, and it's funny, when we talk about object-oriented programming, one of the main things that people have said that has lasted is 
you want to separate stuff out so it's focused on what it does. And an API does that. You're separating that to be that piece and your front end that's interacting with a customer, they're doing that. And where I work, we basically have four teams. We have the database person, my day job. We have the API developers. We have a team of them. We have a matching team of UI developers. They're using Angular. I got there too late to push in the view. That's their loss. <laughs> and then we have the QA team. And they're there to just shake their heads at how many times they have to get us to do something right. So, so is this part of the microservices movement or? API isn't microservices, although you can do something very similar to that. API is usually more of a package service where you're getting all the pieces together. And although there, there is the rolling always wanting to clarify that this is not a microservice. When people use something like Docker, which is a containerized service, and we're considering going that way also, you can actually package each of, each of these pieces separately. And they still work together fine. And when you do that, it's nice because when they scale, then you can scale just the part you want. So, because generally your front end UI doesn't carry the same type of load that an API would. That makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about why you picked Coldbox for this, because I, I know Coldbox, you, you wrote a framework yourself, uh, right. co-op, I think it was called. Yes. Why didn't you use that? Why are you using Coldbox to ask when, a, when I a, created, a direct question? <laughs> when I created co-op, it was referring to collaboration, cooperative. And what I did is I wrote a framework where I could use Cold Fusion's custom tags and they would render that front end UI. So as we started splitting these pieces up and that type of development is becoming more and more scarce, the win that I was providing is no longer the win that gives us the biggest win. So it's still a win if you wanted to do that, but I'm actually recommend people learn something like Vue and split that out. And the whole architecture and framework of the Coldbox community, they were further along in the API development and all of the services and extra stuff they had. So I decided community-wise we'd all advance better if I jumped on that team. So, and anyone who's still using co-op, I still support that for them, but this is for new development. I'm recommending you go that direction. So what in particular do you like about Coldbox for API development in Cold Fusion? There's a, there's a phrase in API development, restful. And I'm sure if some of the guys before I spoke at my first conference, we had some passionate debates over what was appropriate technology and who was, uh, and as we all, some people were saying back then, who's a loser because they're not doing pure object oriented programming. And once that became more social, <laughs> we, we got past the religious purist side of the thing, because these are all principles, they're all design patterns that make things work good. RESTful is a core set of principles that you, if you're going to violate them, you need to have a design reason to do it, not just I would prefer to do it a different way. They're really good principles. So they're a set of best practices, not, not religious things that if you violate them, you go into code hell. <laughs> So with that in mind, when you're looking at those best practices and a framework that's set up to already think down that same pattern, well, that successful pattern of things just lines right up with the routeful way that Coldbox was set. First time I ever did a Coldbox app was in version three, and it was routed way back then. So they're in alignment. And some, when 
you're hearing this is how to do it and you have a framework that's flowing in that direction, this is a good thing because you can put your energy into building the app instead of design hacking the framework to make it do what you're accustomed to or being taught. So cold boxes, it had a lot of that stuff pulling in, number one. Number two, it's headed in that direction with the future features. So it just, that's what I was saying at the beginning, it just works and you're able to concentrate on your work instead of building a framework up. And Sam? another thing is you, sometimes when something's pre-built, it's sort of constraining. Uh, where my day job, we're pulling like three or five different apps together. And it's, we're doing agile as much as we can, but we have one rule, no features left behind. <laughs> yeah, I'd see you're laughing. It's worth laughing, but we can achieve that but that makes it really challenging. But even with that constraint, using cold box and the API, we have not had an issue yet. It's natural, it has, it has never gotten in our way with a feature that's there that didn't help us. So it's always forward moving. So I like that type of a framework. Well, and I know they have a whole section in their documentation about how to, to build REST APIs together with Coldbox. So clearly they're, they're supporting it uh, as well as yeah. the new features you mentioned. So great that you're using that. Now you're using something that I hadn't come across before, Postman. Um, tell us what that is. Well, I was just, you know, creating calls and getting responses back and I would look inside the developer tools inside of uh, Chrome. And that's how I was doing my development. But when I came on this team, they already had a subscription to Postman and they were using Postman because it has a nice GUI and they used the graphical user interface to, okay, here's the address, here's the variables we're sending, we're sending this as a post or a get request. And then they had a thing that showed what came back, which was sort of neat because it was all in one interface. Plus, we could actually save these. So all these different requests, we could save them. Well, I kind of like that because, you know, we could eat. And then I found out, and this is part of the paid version, if you're doing a team, that when I save that request for, some, for reusing, someone else can use that also so we could do share all those things and build up a library well since i started they started adding things like folders so we could organize them and their last 6.0 update they even have workspaces so you have workspaces with set little collections with subfolders inside of that as deep as you want and another thing they put inside there is environments so I'm sitting here building this whole thing up and I'm running it against my local dev laptop. But then we push it up to our common dev thing where we make sure everything we're doing is working together or our QA and I can create different environments and all I do is swap the environment and run the test against that other system. So that became very handy because swapping back and forth, being able to share with a team, this put us on a whole new level for building APIs together. So the issue this is solving is that when you write or consume an API, you're sending either XML or JSON or some complicated piece of HTML that's not very human readable. No. And what this does is it lets you capture that, be able to read it, debug it, see what's going on, replay it if you want to, share yeah, it with other people. So it's free feature. You can replay it. <laughs> <laughs> so that they added that too. And that's part as I've got into Postman, that they're only I, I don't know if they started in twenty twelve or twenty fourteen, but they do such a good job they have over 3 million users. Wow. That there's a reason they have that many users. 
I hope it's not because we're stupid. I'm going to go with the other because I'm a user. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of like in the old days before Postman, you, you were sending these packets of data, but it was really hard to do anything. Now you've got sort of like this Postman, he grabs your letter or your packet of, of data, and then he opens it up, makes it all readable stores away a copy for you, organizes it, even lets you re-deliver the same packets over and over again. Right. Um, well, or you can fake out dummy addresses to send, you know, to test your API against and right. see what's going on. Well, not only is it readable, but they, they have three views as far as what comes back from the browser. They have pretty, so it'll take some of your XML or your JSON and stack it in there so it looks nice. Or they have raw if you don't want it to touch anything, or they have HTML. And we use HTML all the time because when we're building stuff, well, we have errors, imagine that. And when we have errors and it does that dump, well, we can dump it right back to Postman, look at the dump right inside there, we don't have to go to a browser. And if we like, well, what line did that come from? Well, it, when you use a dump in CFML or Lucy, just put your mouse over there, it'll tell you the line the dump was on. And there you go, go back to it. And the other thing you mentioned, one of the things we've started doing, and I'll hit the, this in a moment, this deals with the Agile thing, but the UI guys and the API, got, API guys are working together. So we'll have a story we're working on, we're creating API task, we're creating UI task, and they go together, but we're, we're separate, obviously, by what I've described. So how do we bring that together? Well, the first thing we do is QA, UI, API, DB, we all meet together to discuss the story we're trying to accomplish with this ticket. So we start figuring out, okay, what's my part? What does UI want? And UI is like, okay, what do you, and we're going back and forth on this. Then UI and API meet together, and we're using Postman. And what we do is we map out, okay, what am I supposed to be sending to the API? So UI is figuring that out. And I'm like, okay, what are you thinking you're sending me? So we're actually doing this in a shared work environment. And what am I supposed to be sending back to you? So we create what's called a mock of that. And if they want, they can actually hit the mock service because Postman does that also. Or we're just mapping it out. So when I jump in and actually start coding my API, well, I can actually look at what they're expecting and write to that. But there's another feature in Postman. Postman will also do testing. So I can take that and store it, so what it's supposed to give back, and then I can actually write a behavioral driven test in Postman to, to whatever degree of pickiness we want to go to, and we can test it. So we write that test, and then when I start writing my code, I can pre-write my unit test, so I'm doing test driven development style. I still do BDD, but but we pre-write the test, and I pre-write the test in Postman. Now, yes, of course, sometimes the tests get modified, but I've got a basic test to know this is what's going in, this is what's coming out, a test to validate all this stuff. And I've got that before we even start coding, and they, the UI guy loves that too because he knows what to expect. He's coding, this is what I'm expecting back. This is what I'm supposed to be sending you. And with me, it's the opposite order. Okay, this is what you're sending me. This is what you expect back. And we have that standard right out the gate. So Postman is basically like turning the light on in a phase of development that's usually kind of uh, murky. <laughs> so you, you can fake out both sides of that. You can fake out you as Cold Fusion developers sending that API and making sure you've got it formatted correctly in Postman, but the UX developer can consume the API from a mock version of the API before you've even coded it. Yeah, just like in Postman, you set a different environment. All you have to do is in the UI, they just have, a, have something that they toggle and flip the switch so it knows 
for this feature, aim this at the mock server. And obviously it's, it's going to be statically mocked, not dynamic, but you know, is it a 200 request? Is it a 404 request? Because nothing responded, 409, it wasn't authorized. All those standard things that are part of RESTful services, it covers it. Well, that sounds like that avoids a whole bunch of bugs and miscommunications between team members. It, it, it reduces, you get to work on the meaningful bugs faster. <laughs> <laughs> Any developer who doesn't work on bugs, you can't teach the rest of us anything because we don't program the same. <laughs> Now, w what about when you've got your API live? Do you still use Postman then for monitoring or other reasons? Or? Well, actually, Postman does have a monitoring service. So you could actually use it for that just to make sure it's up or whatever type of monitoring your creative benefit solution has. But the, the other side of it is we use this because we keep changing code. And there's this phrase in testing called regression testing. Because it's amazing how a change that had nothing to do with something else turns out that it really did. And it, you change something over here and it breaks something on the other side you never expected. And another neat thing Postman does is it walks through the test. You can even make the test intelligent. Okay, run this test, and if I get this type of a response back, then run this part of the test next. So the tests aren't just a mechanical thing. It, you can actually build a level of intelligence and flow into your test. So, so if you're running a monitor, on something like that, that mm. might have a benefit. And, and the test also can be taken offline and run with a continuous delivery build type system like Postman, Travis, Circle, CI, whatever. And with that, you can move those up. So I write some new code and I don't just run, what we do is we run our unit test local, but then we'll run when we're doing a build push to another server we'll run our Newman test there, and Newman is the name of the JavaScript tool that will run your Postman test. So we, that's what we do our validating. And, you know, just, it makes stuff more visible. So just so I'm clear, you're using some kind of continuous integration tool like Jenkins or? Jenkins in our case, but it's, it's yeah. not exclusive to that. And then every, every time you check in a change in, into your source control, it goes off and runs all these tests. Well, uh, we're doing again. it, and I don't know if it's best practice or not, but our, our goal is to do it before you merge it back to the master branch. Mm. Because what you have is a master branch, and you go off on a feature branch. So mm -hmm. we're building this new feature, and we have what we call a two-week sprint. And in our two-week sprint, we're trying to deliver new features. And we typically are delivering, you know, 12 to 20 new features every two weeks. And those are minor features. We're not building major features. But what that does is it gives us that little, slow, continuous win. And let's see. Yeah, I'm going to cheat because I'm listening to an audio book right now. So I'm going to just look it right up here called Barking Up the Wrong Tree. And when I was listening to it last night, he talked about a lot of times we're biting off too big a piece. And we're like, okay. And it's that concept of what's a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. And if we set that big goal, we think we're going to win. But what we've learned in agile development, that continuous, ha, I got to win. I made progress. I'm making progress. I'm winning that tends to keep people more engaged. And it's harder to beat someone who's more engaged than someone who isn't. If you're creating a BHAG so that you can engage, you still won't maintain the same level of engagement as someone who has that regular steady winning solution. And that's part of what Agile is about. 
So you, you've really embraced Agile. Tell us why, why you think listeners should be looking at Agile uh, for their development life cycle. Well, I say, number one, if whatever you're doing is working, it works. I don't say, oh, what we used to do is we were such losers. Because if you think about that, you know, it's exponential. We were losers. We were losers squared before that. We were losers cubed. No, we weren't because we made products that delivered. So what I'm looking at with Agile is just a bigger win because the market's getting more competitive. And if you want to be more competitive and stay in the flow, you have to have the bigger win. And I believe Agile actually does that over water flow and some of these other methodologies. In fact, I didn't know really what water flow was until I learned Agile and stopped doing some of the water flow things. It's like, oh, that's what water flow is. It's not bad, it's not losing, but I just, for us, our team is finding a bigger win. So, so, so the traditional uh, long life cycle development is where you do all the requirements up front and then you go away into a dark cave for six to 12 months or how long it is, and then come back uh, and show what you've done. Whereas in Agile, every two weeks, you've got new features to show. Correct. And what we actually do, and in fact, they were, when I started the podcast here, the rest of the team is showing when you do Agile, one of the things you do is you have what we call stakeholders. And our stakeholders, they're the people who are going to be using the software or making money off it. It, it depends on your Agile scenario but they're the ones that will be making the investments. So you get a collection of them and every two weeks, you're showing them your progress. They're giving you feedback. When you wait six months to show people what you're doing and they're like, I've got this problem with this one feature and I talked about the regression testing, you have the same thing but in an explosive form. Um, we, we can redo that, but it's going to take us two months where if they would have brought that up along the way. It, okay. You, you just put it in the flow. It rarely has a large impact when your users are meeting with you regularly. So that's one of the big differences. In fact, when I get done here, we also have what we call a retrospect meeting. So every two weeks we get together at the end of our sprint. And when we get together at the end of our sprint, we talk about two things. What went well and what could have gone better. And I really like that. That's the attitude and openness that creates is way different. Like, okay, who messed up? You know, you made the whole team look bad. I did not. I just exposed you. No. <laughs> so and we do. And one of our rules for our Agile team, a lot of teams have adopted this, is if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. I never heard that in Waterfall. I guess they could make that up. But one of the things is it is actually working. So like we'll do things like we name our sprints or two-week sprints. And... Right now, since it's every two weeks, this is the F week because we're going alphabetically and we have themes. So last sprint was named Einsteinium because it was E and someone had to pick a chemical element. And that's a reactive chemical element. So the whole time during the sprint, we had to put up with Einstein puns and plays. And so this time it was F. And, and it had to be something from Ikea. Now, it was, we have a random category that someone from the team is picking. So they picked Fracta. That's that little blue bag at Ikea. And since we're an expedite transportation company, that, that word Fracta means transport. So that, it was my turn to destroy the... Uh, sprint planning meeting, which we have on Wednesday. So I opened up the meeting with a pun. I said, okay, I'm gonna destroy this one. I've got the first pun. They're like, okay, I says, this sprint is in the bag. And they're like, okay, one guy's like, I'm leaving now. He says, I'll be back in two weeks. 
And then they were complaining at the end of it because we had more points than we've ever bid. And they're like, hey, this is scary. And of course, someone had to throw out the pun. You know, if this is too many points, we could just spend another five or 10 minutes and refract uh, our bidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, and, and we try not to let that interfere with the flow, but no, we're we're having fun. In fact, because it was Ikea, when our stakeholders came, we had Swedish meatballs. And during the presentation, yes, we did. We showed a video clip of the Swedish chef. <laughs> <laughs> so they're getting what they want. They can see the traction. It creates a whole different spirit. But, and I will warn you, when you first jump into it, it is so foreign to how most people do development, that you don't get a lot of traction that first or second sprint. And you're like, oh, we're losing traction. But once you start getting it, it's a whole different flow. And what you do is your team actually starts learning to work as a team. You, and the team thing just goes way up. And there's a whole lot less supervision because when you're doing agile right, supervision would get in the way. And it sounds, but just research it. Uh, you, you'll yeah, and then that's why you don't, you don't have a manager like that pointy haired boss that Dilbert often dealt with. You've got a scrum master who's there to facilitate right. the team and remove roadblocks. So now my boss is the project owner. So we, we laugh about that. In fact, he used to be one of the guys in code. And he'll, we tease him, he'll make a change once while we're like, hey, get out of the code, get out of the code. <laughs> <laughs> now, people might think that having fun while you're doing software development is like uh, a waste of time, but I, I'm wondering, does that lead to some of these other benefits that you get better teamwork and maybe people are able to solve problems better because they're, they're not worried so much about being blamed. They, they know it's all, you know, a more like-hearted endeavor here's some of the things i've learned when the boss is overseeing you okay how are you doing how much progress you're making how much progress you're making what what you have is guys that will sit there literally for one to two hours with a problem that they don't want to share are working on something because they don't want to interfere with someone else's workflow and then tell the boss well, I couldn't get my stuff done because John was bugging me. So that spirit of cooperation just isn't the same to begin with. And if you're stuck in something for a half hour and you've got a question, we pop each other. It doesn't matter. Well, if you don't know, well, let's learn it in the next half hour instead of spending two hours trying to learn it, delivering it, and having code review kick it back. That, that's just not productive. And a lot of those things that we don't actually realize are part of the classic workflow because no one will admit that that's what they're going through. <laughs> Let's see, what is uh, Hippocrates? We know him for medicine, but do you know what else he was famous for? Cold fusion coding? No. <laughs> he was famous for, for uh, acting. Oh. That's why we have the phrase hypocrite, because they oh. had these masks they would put in front of their faces. Oh. And they called actors back then hypocrites. Well, most developers, when they sit, they don't want to admit they're struggling with something, are ready to join his acting guild because they're hypocrites. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But that's one thing Agile has, and we didn't have that problem with the ego, but we didn't have the engagement. And one of these classic historical things in Agile is you want to make sure that everyone's local in the same building so they can interact. But we're using Zoom, we're using uh, Slack with the video chat services they have, and we're using Visual Studio Code on the API side. Have you heard of Live Share yet? No, I haven't, I haven't you have played that one there. I'm invited to their private beta on Microsoft right now, but it's really cool. We'll be sitting coding and I'll call someone up on Slack or they'll call me 
and like, okay, I can't get this code figured out. I know it's right there, but there's no need for me to burn time. And and it's also that magic when you ask someone else something, the question, the answer comes to you. That's another reason we do that. But what you do is you do a live share in Visual Studio Code, and the other person gets a URL, and instantly they see all your code. You're sharing the code just like a Google Docs session, but you're sharing the code. And if they want to go looking at something else, they see it. So it's an interactive editing session instead of a screen, let me have your mouse, let me take the mouse back. You're both, so what colors do you use in your editor? Do you like the light screen? Do you have psychedelic colors? Or do you have vision problem and your stuff's all big? It doesn't matter when you share the code. They get to keep their UI while they're in the code. And you can see where each other are. It creates that whole paired development. Now, we don't do paired development full time, but anytime we catch them struggling, we're like, pair up, instantly pair up. And that really has accelerated what we're able to deliver speed wise. So, you, you do do some pair, pair programming. Uh, right. as part of your agile as we're well as doing code inclusive, reviews but we're also not local and we haven't found that to be a problem so in fact we've we're letting more people work from home more of the week so <laughs> well that's a great thing yeah. so and we actually and we, i've monitored this we communicate more now than we when we did <laughs> we're all in the office there's more communication more productivity Something's working, but that breaks the classic when you'll be taught agile, you'll probably hear you need to be in one place, but that's not so true anymore. So you mentioned earlier that you're doing behavior uh, driven development. How, how does that tie in with all this? Basically, that's just a way of writing your unit tests or your integration test. And when we write the test in Postman, I, this is my way of looking at it. I could be inaccurate. And that, that's part of the joy, having fun. If I'm inaccurate, we'll have fun with it. But this is how I look at it. You have unit tests, which means nothing outside of this unit can influence or create what we call a flaky test. And you have integration tests. That's when you've got two things working together and you need to make sure they work together. A unit, you mock those things outside it. So when we do our postman test, that's what I call an end-to-end -end integration test. Now I know we're not doing the UPI, it's end-to-end -end API. So we're hitting it, everything runs up inside it, it comes back and we make sure we have a proper response. So to me, that's end-to-end -end integration instead of a partial integration. But those are all integrated, whereas the unit, nothing outside of here am I actually testing. I only want to know the lines of code that are unique to this unit are all being hit without failure. Now, sometimes you'll take it beyond that for testing specific logic, but the main goal of unit testing is knowing you can flow through your code without choke, without a line of code that would never run. <laughs> and behavior driven development is when you look, okay, what are the critical issues? Because you have critical issues, you have important issues, and then you have stuff that really, why'd you test that? <laughs> it's, it's like, why would you test can cold fusion add one plus one? You, you don't test that. That's, that's a dumb test. So you're writing the test that actually add meaning and all of us have a limited amount of time. So, so you've got to determine where's your gain and loss. And because all these tests are being stored, whenever we put new code up, all the old tests run against it. And, and the crucial mindset difference with behavior driven development is you write the tests first before you write the code. Is that Correct. true? Or, yeah, it's partially true. It, it's also how you write the test because the personality of a test is when you write a classic unit test and they're both actually unit tests, but a classic unit test is 
Okay. I have this thing that I'm going to pass into this component method and I get the results and I want to say, did it give me this answer? Did it give me this answer? And you're just basically, it's like checkbox testing. When you're doing behavior driven development, it's like writing a story. So, okay, I have this component that sends out emails when an order is made. And then down inside, when I send the correct, a correct email address, then expect the email to be sent. So we're doing a story here. Whereas if you're doing unit testing, it would be, here's the name of this test, email send. So I call the method and I say assert email was sent. And it's sort of dry. So the reason it's called behavior driven development is because we're talking about the behavior, you're actually writing stories. And there is even a alternate way of doing it that is extremely story oriented. But, and test box will do both of those versions, uh, which is the testing framework that works with uh, cold box APIs. And, and which, then, by the way, we're doing behavior-driven development style code in our Postman test also. Oh, okay. We're doing that both sides. It, it's slightly different. We started before there, some of the updates they had. So we're using an extra library we pulled in, and we're using the Chai JavaScript library for what we're doing. But it's very little difference. So... I hope your talk at Into the Box on all this goes well. It sounds like a really exciting topic. Um, I just want to change gears slightly now and, and ask you, why are you proud to program in CFML? Well, it used to be because it's been around so long. In fact, I have what, two sons that have followed in the software development. One of them is doing Cold Fusion and the others in a renegade technology dot something. Uh, it seems like a dot's the end of a sentence. I don't know why you'd name your technology dot anything, but <laughs> <laughs> but he he asked and I looked it up and do you know that Java, PHP, and Cold Fusion were all created the same year? I, I knew they were pretty much the same age. I didn't know it was exact. Because yes, .NET's a youngster, they're right? They're the same age. So apparently that was a year for durable technologies. Yeah. And one thing is Cold Fusion has stood the test of time, number one. Number two, I know Cold Fusion compiles into Java, but I know a lot of Java developers who have chosen Cold Fusion because they don't want to get down into the granular stuff. When, when you write Java, your packaging stuff. Cold Fusion has a lot of stuff packaged up already for you, but you can still reach out and add the Java into it if you want to. In fact, Cold Box has a few libraries that it reaches out and does that same thing, including Command Box. And for a while, I was felt the pull away because all these other guys were getting these package tools, the command line tools, and I'm going to give credit here. Brad Wood put together a thing called Command Box. And we have the same type of thing in our community that they were getting. And it's an absolutely amazing piece of, it just changes the whole development. If, you, if you're in Cold Fusion and you haven't tried Command Box, I not at all shame on you. It's okay if you're missing out, but I'd like you to not miss out. You gotta try it, it's free. And there is no commercial version. Brad, you should have made money on this. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is amazing. So um, speaking of prices, that, the Postman thing we were talking about, that's yeah. free up to a certain number of uses per month, right? Right. It, um, it, well, actually, it's free for one user. That's, that's your number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I will go look. Let's see. I think it's free up to a thousand API calls a month, something like right. that. Right, and that's pretty hard to hit. So, Postman. 
And, and then it's only like eight eight dollars a user a month beyond that. If, right, it's eight dollars a need user, to go. which is so. reasonable, very reasonable, especially with all the features. And you can share if you can't, if you have a team and you can't save eight dollars a month, they're not using Postman, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it, that's one of those things that absolutely pays for itself. And I am going to mention this at the show, if I remember during my session, uh, someone may think that I'm pushing Postman because I get affiliate or something like that. <laughs> I don't get squat from them. The only thing I get from them is a great product. And if you guys start using it, you can kick back ideas my way. And it's communities the reason I'm promoting it because it is a very social solution. So that, and by the way, you can do private and team workspaces. So, and you share the things across work. It just, I almost hate it because I have a reputation for coming up with new ideas that people could add into software. And Postman has done so good at adding stuff in that I'm like, what? That's one of the things I like to do, and it's hard to do because it does so much. So, <laughs> so I like it. Yeah, I do. Right. So what, what would it take to make Cold Fusion even more alive this year? Uh, when I look at making Cold Fusion alive more, uh, and like I say, I've been talking with a number of other developers about actually putting together a CFML online school so along the idea of Laracast, that's one of the things I'm looking to accomplish. And an, another thing, basically, I think a lot of what it takes to get alive is you look at a project and what actually gives you traction. Because there's a lot of people who are still using Cold Fusion and they're using it the way we did 10 years ago. And we've learned stuff, things that help us. So if we can help them learn some of the ease of these systems we're putting together, that's half of it. The other half of what I think it takes to really help us to get alive is for us to start putting out solutions that are based on it that pull people in. Because new people coming in I mean, that's what we're getting in cold, uh, command box and stuff are answering those questions. They're making it easier for people to come in. So more of what I'm thinking is we, we just need to keep doing what we're doing because although we didn't have it in the past, I think we have momentum. We have the right products there. We just need to get more, more people aware that not only does cold fusion work, but we have command box. We have cold box. These are very competitive, mature, functional. The stuff works with Docker. So there's no, you can now host about anywhere. You don't even have to find a cold fusion host anymore. Things are changing. So I would say just be awesome at what you do, build the reputation, because I think cold fusion over the last year has actually changed. And I don't know if you heard this. There's a side note there. A lot of people thought Cold Fusion is dead. It was dying. Do you remember that? I, I do remember it. That's why one of the reasons I started the CF Alive podcast, because I just wanted to get the message out that it's alive, growing, and a mod can be written as a mod and used as a modern language. Do you know the Cold Fusion is dead was actually a myth? A false Yes, one. I do know. It's been a myth for the last 10 years. Yeah, but you know? Do you know where we found out what it was? Oh, you, go ahead. Tell me. You have services like uh, Built With. Mm -hmm. Built With, yep. the way that they check and they showed Cold Fusion was going down and down and down, less Cold yep. Fusion sites. Then we found out that they have a algorithms they're using to find out what a site was built with. And they used to look for .cfc or .cfm. Yeah. And we're using routed servers now, which don't put that anywhere. Yeah. So there was no indicator beeping. This is a Cold Fusion site. So Adobe's even mentioned that Cold Fusion, their market share has continued to grow, but 
sites like built with can't detect it so they're claiming we're shrinking and they're just wrong and we love them anyways because they say it's good information they just yes hey, nobody's right all the time <laughs> <They're just wrong. laughs> yeah I, I unfortunately i do know about the built with issue because i spent about six months corresponding with their tech support trying to convince them that they're doing it wrong and here's how to do it right um <laughs> they didn't quite get it so. if they would tell us what they're built with we could write the code for them <laughs> 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 there you go. Well, it's uh, founded by some guy in New Zealand. I, I even tried to hook up with their uh, uh, C, CEO to see if I could convince him. He, he, you know, because sometimes in companies the tech support doesn't Since necessarily I was born in communicate the South well. America, all other Southern Americas will get this. Bless their heart. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> But yeah, I know that uh, Brad Wood was successful with uh, one of the other companies that monitors different technologies. Yes. So, uh, you know, there is hope. <laughs> um, so what are you looking forward to at this year's Into the Box conference, John? What I'm looking forward to is I've got my feet wet in Docker, but I, I don't want to go on a long swim. <laughs> And I'm looking to roll my stuff that I, my personal sites and stuff I do for others and hopefully the company I'm working at, I'm looking very excitedly at what Docker provides in the containerization. And I, so I'm going a day early and I'm going to pay my way to go to the container sessions. So. Do they have that is great. Time? And, yeah, and, I, and there's also another speaker who's doing some uh, Jenkins integration. In particular, mm. I'm looking forward to that session. Yeah, I did a, a, an interview with uh, Mark Drew uh, all about you know doing Docker. I don't know if that's the session you were thinking of going to. No, but, um, this is not the session, the day class before John class. Oh, okay. The whole day, the full day one. Yes. No. A lot of those are already sold out, I think. Um, yes. So it looks like a, a great event and it's looking, they've got far more people registered already. We're still a month away from the event and I think they've got more people registered now than came last year. So great. <laughs> should be a great event and a chance to enjoy uh, Texas uh, hospitality. <laughs> That's where I was in the Navy. So three hours from there. So it's for me, it's good to get back into Texas because I enjoyed my time there. Ah, okay. So if people want to find you online, what's, what are the best ways to do that? Well, my sites are being flipped at the moment because I'm pulling them now into the cold box and everything. And, but uh, so sensible.com is my core site, but my coding site is SOS, SOSAPPS.com, SOS apps. And that's, I like that acronym is because I like servant oriented software. Ah, excellent. So we'll put those links together with all the cool stuff you mentioned today. Um, and the transcript from the show notes, uh, together all on the show notes page at the Terratech site. And thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Good to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>